Um, to, today I'm beginning a, uh, a four-part series and I'm calling the series Sozo. Sozo is the uh, Greek word for saved. But uh, I'm only calling it that because I need a title for God's complete transformation of your life. And over these uh, four preaching sessions, we're going to deal with salvation, we're going to deal with deliverance, we're going to deal with healing, and we're going to deal with restoration. These are the four cornerstones, if you like, of the gospel. And I think some, if not all, of these areas are quite misunderstood within the church. And when we talk about salvation, or being saved, I want to start with the most obvious scripture in the Word of God, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the promise of God to anybody who puts their faith in what Jesus did for us on the cross. And it goes on to say in John 3.17 that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, might be sozoed, if you like, the Greek. And depending on your level of religious indoctrination, quite a bit of what I will say over this series on God's transforming power might have the capacity to offend you. Not offend your spirit, but offend what's been planted in you by religious doctrine and religious spirits over centuries of the life of the church. That's okay, because I don't have any time for religion. I've got time for Jesus. I've got time for what God did and made available to me through Jesus. Jesus did not come to start a religious system. He came to make it possible for every single one of us to have a perfectly restored relationship with God. See, if you were brought up in a typical evangelical religious environment, you were taught that you were a dirty, rotten sinner and only by God's grace and the blood of Jesus have you escaped the fires of hell which you so richly deserve. That's, evangelist, that's the evangelical idea of salvation, 101. But the truth is very different. See, all those elements are still there. Sin, God's grace, the blood of Jesus, potentially the fires of hell. But the reason that God came through Jesus Christ has a completely different emphasis. It's quite simple. God loves you so much that he has to have you. He values you above anything that you can count. Your value is not measured by your ideas of self-worth. Your value is not determined by your failures or successes. Because it's very easy to see your own corruption, your own failings, your sinfulness. All you have to do is be honest with yourself. And you will see those things at work in your life. But God sees that past that. The price that God paid for you determines your value. The price that God paid for you determines your value. And he bankrupted heaven to have you. He did it to save us, to sozo us. But getting saved and the very nature and meaning of salvation is quite different to what we have generally been taught in the evangelical church. The word sozo for save 
means deliver, protect, heal, preserve, do well, make whole, keep safe and sound, rescue from danger or destruction. When we talk about getting saved, we're talking about this concept called salvation. There are seven words in Hebrew and Greek that cover the word salvation. And all of those seven words mean essentially the same thing. That salvation brings you out from under the power, the penalty, the presence and the pleasure of sin. Salvation is your rescue from danger or destruction. It brings about your deliverance, your preservation, your protection. Salvation means to be in a place of safety. It means to be in a place of health. It means to have your welfare assured. It means to bring you into prosperity. Ooh, I said it. It means to bring you into prosperity, to bring you into freedom, to give you victory, to avenge you against your enemies, which are not in the physical realm, they're in the spiritual. To defend you against harm and to give you a life of perfect liberty. That's salvation. And unless every area of your life measures up completely to all of what I just said, then your salvation is not a one-time event. It is an ongoing process that will last you for the rest of your life and into all eternity. And when you enter into eternity, you will be perfected. When we see him, we will be like him. Is what the Bible says. Every last imperfection that has not yet been dealt with will be dealt with the moment that we stand before God and we are made like his son. Now this doesn't mean that if your life doesn't measure up at this moment to all those things that I read out, it doesn't mean that you won't go to heaven. But it does mean that you'll be limited in how much heaven you release around you. And how much heaven is released in you. Because Jesus taught his disciples to pray, your kingdom come. What do you want his kingdom to come to? I want his kingdom to come to me. I want his kingdom to spring to life in me and flourish. And then I want it to flourish through me to those around me. I came into the kingdom having had so much of my life destroyed by my own choices. I don't apologise to those who have heard this part of my story before because I felt like God asked me to mention this particular aspect. I was dead three times, physically dead, each time from drug overdoses. In one of those drug overdoses in the middle of King's Cross in 1984, in a prostitute's hotel room above the El Alamein Fountain, I was blue, no heartbeat, dead on the floor for at least 10 minutes before an ambulance could come from St Vincent's. The very fact that I stand before you today in my right mind, sharing this testimony with you, is a miracle of salvation. I am not exaggerating one aspect of what I just told you. In fact, I went to the extent, before I started sharing this aspect of my story publicly, I went to the extent of ringing my ex-wife Lorraine and asking her to verify it because she was there with me when this happened. When I came back into the kingdom, I wasn't particularly addicted to any substance. But I tell you what I carried, I carried fear. That wasn't just fear, it was terror. It was terror of addiction because I knew that I had gone back and gone back and gone back and gone back to the things that had almost destroyed my life. And yet here's an aspect of God and his saving power, his delivering power, that a few weeks after I gave my life to the Lord, 21 years ago, a few nights after I gave my life, sorry, a few weeks after I gave my life to the Lord, I went to bed one night and I had so much trouble getting to sleep because I was scared. 
Because you see, I remembered that time a few years before when I had woken up in the morning with this craving for heroin and cocaine that would not leave me alone until I gave into it. And I knew that I was powerless over this thing and I didn't know what to do about it. And yet God sovereignly came in the middle of the night in my sleep and I woke up with this awareness that drug addiction would never again play any part in my life and it never has. See, God promises to come and touch every single area of your life. And some things he does supernaturally in the moment and other things you have to walk through. Other things will come and cause you pain. Other things will challenge your very faith in God. You will call out to God for something and the opposite will happen. You'll go, God, why did that happen? It brings you to a place. It brings you to a place. Where you see how truly small you are. It brings you to a place of complete dependence upon Him. We're talking about a God who knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. We're talking about a God who understood every aspect of the challenges that you will go through, who understood every aspect of your failures, every aspect of your successes, every aspect of your triumph. And we're talking about a God who says that your complete salvation Deliverance, healing and restoration is guaranteed by nothing less than the word of God himself, Jesus, and his blood, that you will be sozoed. Not just saved from your sin, but completely restored into everything that God has called you to be. This experience of being saved encompasses, wraps around every single area of your life. This process begins and will be brought to completion supernaturally. We've got to get out of our heads this idea that somehow all by themselves a person uh, comes to their own sound reasoning that yes, I should follow Jesus. In the Bible it says this in John 6.44 No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You sit here in this church today, if you are a Christian, you, if you, you sit here today, whether you are a Christian or not, because God has organised every single circumstance in your life for you to be in the place where you are right now, whether you know him or not. And I pray that if you don't, that you will get to the end of this service and you will go, you know what? He's right. I need Jesus and it'll be nothing to do with me. It'll be because the Father draws you. The Father draws you. No one can come except the Father draws him. But what we don't understand is how revolutionary this was to the people that heard it. We've heard all this terminology. We hear our Father. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son. The people that Jesus spoke to when he said these things did not have that concept. That when he said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I want you to see a little distinction here. English was my favourite subject at school. And so when I see things in the Word of God that have uh, the potential to change the way I think about what I'm reading, I focus in on them. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Jesus says the Father. He doesn't say my Father. He says the Father. Why this distinction? Jesus is pointing us to something that was revolutionary to the understanding of his listeners. That God is your Father. He is not a God to be appeased like the demonic false gods of all the religions of the world. He's not waiting to hurl down thunderbolts at you every time you mess up. He is the Father standing at the gate of his house, looking lovingly down the road. 
for the return of his prodigal children so that we might receive the inheritance that he already set aside for us. God's got your number. He's got your name. He's got your date of birth. He's got everything you've ever done in your life, everything you've ever aspired to, everything that you've been ashamed of, all of it is in his perfect memory bank. He knows you. He knows you and he has to have you. He has to have you. He sees the gulf between him and you. And he has to have you. So he bankrupted heaven itself so that he could have that. But he won't do it against your will. In Romans 8 verse 29 it says that for whom he foreknew, that's you and I, he knows all about you, he also predestined, in other words he knew you were going to come, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, that's Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Saviour, but he is also my brother. Because I'm now in the bloodline of God. This is a bit different to you dirty rotten sinner, come and repent. When I said he bankrupted heaven to have you, The Bible says he even sent his angels to minister on your behalf so that you can have that fullness of salvation. You know what I believe about my experience years and years ago when I was dead on the floor of this terrible little hotel room for 10 minutes? I believe that God dispatched his ministering spirits to come into that hotel room and keep me alive and fight off the spirit of death so that eventually I would come to the place where I surrendered my life to him. How can I say that? Because in Hebrews 14, Hebrews 1 verse 14, when the writer talks about angels, he says, are they not all ministering spirits? All. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Do you realise that you are surrounded by angels in your daily walk through life? You don't often see them. Sometimes you can sense their presence, just like you can sense a demonic presence. But they're there and they're constantly ministering on your behalf because God wants to make you complete and whole. And there is a a, a battle going on in the spiritual realm for every aspect of your existence. But Christ says you will be victorious. Christ says you will overcome. Christ says you will inherit the crown of righteousness. Christ says you will spend eternity in God, in heaven with him. From the cradle to the grave. God's purpose is to bring to completion this saving process called salvation. Stop thinking about it like it's the sinner's prayer because it's not. Salvation is past tense in that when you first put your faith in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus, your future was assured. When you made that decision, your future was insured. But salvation is present tense in that God is working through every aspect of your life to completely bring about all the things that I mentioned before. And to remind you, this is what God is doing in your life right now. He's bringing you out from under the penalty, the power, the presence and the pleasure of sin. He's rescuing you from danger and destruction. He's bringing about your deliverance. He is preserving you. He is protecting you. He's bringing you to a place of of safety, of health of welfare and prosperity. He's bringing you into freedom. He's giving you victory. He's avenging you against your enemies. He's defending you against harm. He is bringing you into a place of complete victory against all the power of hell and Satan so that you might live in the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit released to every believer. It is there. You can have it. I said that salvation is present tense. It's also future tense in that the final enemy to be defeated, the Bible says, is death itself. 
Romans 10, 8 to 13. What does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you are saved? No. Will be. Will be. Your future is assured, but the completion of that salvation process is not yet complete. You will be. It's, pre, uh, it's present tense as well in Acts 2.47 when the, the great revival that was the birth of the church happened. It says in Acts 2.47 that they were praising God and having favour with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. We are being saved. You are right in this moment. You are being washed by the word of God, the Bible says. You are being saved. Your salvation is being made more complete just by the fact that you are sitting under the word of God. Do you know I've seen people come into this church who were not Christian and had to leave in the middle of sermons because the word of God convicted them and they could not stand to be washed by the Word of God, because the Word of God washes and it exposes. It can, exposes the condition of our heart. It exposes the good. It exposes the bad. All for one purpose, that we might be more like Jesus. Amen. When Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians, if you read 1 Corinthians, you will know how, um, how badly behaved they were. Naughty little Christians. Doing, doing all sorts of stuff that they weren't supposed to be doing. In 2 Corinthians, he writes to them again and he talks about his first letter and he talks about what that letter produced in them. These are people that have come to evangelical salvation, in inverted commas, um, already. And he says, Godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. And in the evangelical sense of the term, they're already saved. But what Paul is saying here is that the words that he speaks to them, the admonishments that he gives them, the encouragement that he gives them is bringing repentance, change of mind that leads to a change of heart, leads to a change of action. It's bringing repentance that leads to salvation. That they are more thoroughly saved as a result of reading his letter than they were before they read it. You are now more thoroughly saved in the hour or so that we've been here in church than you were when you walked in. Simply because this is all part of God's complete process of salvation. So this raises the question for all of us. How saved am I? Now, I promise you, I'm not getting into the whole Calvinism, uh, eternal security Arminianism, all the different fights you can get into in the church about whether you're once saved, always saved, all that sort of stuff. But what you can see from what I've already shared with you is that this salvation that God has already released to you is an ongoing process. And so we need to take stock, as it were, and say, how much of the promises of God are a reality in my life? And how much of my salvation is my responsibility? Because we have a part to play with this. We can refuse what God wants to do in our lives. And he will honour that refusal. So I've got this definition. Salvation is the relentless pursuit of God until we see the fullness of his glory manifested in and through us. But it works both ways because I could just as equally say salvation is the relentless pursuit by God until we see the fullness of his glory manifested in and through us. We are called to relentlessly pursue God. It's there in scripture. In Jeremiah 29, 13, it says that you will seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Have you had seasons in your life when you felt kind of spiritually dead? Have you had seasons in your life where you couldn't just work out what God was trying to do and so you took some steps back and there was just no life, 
No life. No life. What God calls us to do is to press through those seasons until breakthrough comes. Because every breakthrough from God should bring us closer to him and closer to the person of Jesus. We would be more like him. We have a part to play. Philippians 2, 12 to 16. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, hang on, is this in the New Testament? Yes. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? Don't frown at me, it's here. <laughs> he goes on to qualify it a little bit. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Can you see that God calls us into union with him, into relationship, that we have a part to play? The Bible says that if we draw back, his soul takes no pleasure in us. He calls us forward. The awesome, all-encompassing power and love of God has been made available to every aspect of your life. And the key to this, I'm sorry, but the key to this is the absolute surrender of everything in your life. No matter how much we surrender, no matter what we sacrifice, no matter what we lay down, it could never possibly be compared to what we receive in return. I want you to think about it for a minute. Before the worlds were formed. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The great mystery of the eternal Godhead sitting up there in heaven. And God creates the earth and he, sends Adam, he creates Adam and Eve so that we might be part of him. We, formed out of his, we, we are made in his image, formed out of the dust but made in his image. Created to have eternal life. Everything gets, gets screwed up by sin. And so, Father God, because he is a father and not some avenging deity, says in his grace and in his goodness and mercy and kindness, his loving kindness which lasts forever, he says, I have to do something about this because I love what I have created and I cannot stand to be separated from them. And so he turns to what the Bible says is the lamb slain from before the beginning of the world. Before you were born, God knew you would screw up. Before you were born, God made a plan to restore you back to him. And there in the heavenlies, God turns to Jesus and says, Son, will you go down there and do something about this? Will you go down there and take on everything that has destroyed them and come back victorious so that they can be restored back to right relationship with me? And so heaven is bankrupted. The inheritance of heaven leaves heaven and becomes sinful man. The angels are all sent with the same purpose to draw us to salvation so that we might come and be restored to him. And so I see the possibility in Scripture that we have such a part to play in what God wants to do in our life. And the key to this is intimacy and pursuing Him. It's going to cost you something. I promise you, it's going to cost you something. But the reward far outweighs any price you might pay. 
About six or seven years ago, I was dissatisfied with my spiritual walk. I'd got to the place where I was like, is this it? And I got challenged by uh, some of you who have experienced his ministry, Pastor Raf Shaw from Adelaide. He came up to, um, to minister in this church a, a couple of years before Kerry and I took over pastoring the church. And he talked about what happens when you get up in the middle of the night and you lay aside your own time and say, God, I'm coming before you. I'm coming before you. I'm sacrificing my time because I have to have more of you. I can tell you that that will transform your life. Absolutely transform your life. Yesterday morning, um, I had prepared most of this, uh, most of this message. See, this is the fruit of the passionate pursuit of God. I could tie up this message uh, with an illustration, an analogy. I could preach about the cross. I could make you feel guilty. I could do all sorts of stuff. I could exercise some evangelical uh, manipulation. But I was, uh, I was cycling yesterday morning and I was thinking about the end of this message. I'm coming to a close now. Famous last words. <laughs> I was thinking about, Lord, how can I possibly convey what it is that you have made available to us? And God spoke to me directly. I'm just cycling along. He said, tell them about Hosea. I thought, what? He said, tell them about Hosea. <laughs> now, I know the story of Hosea, but I saw something in this that is going to bless you. I saw something in this that has the potential to accelerate you into the next season of your relationship with God. See, Hosea was a prophet of God. And he prophesied in a time of great financial prosperity, but great moral bankruptcy. And everybody around him, to one degree or another, served other gods. Just like we do. And lest you be concerned that I delve into the theological implications of everything that Hosea did, I ain't going to do that. I'm going to give you something straight. What did God ask Hosea to do? He asked him to marry a prostitute. This was not a glorious white wedding. And it certainly wasn't like the farcical stuff you see on The Bachelor or, or what's that other one? Married at first sight. What a travesty that thing is. I'm telling you, you're allowing the demonic into your home when you watch that thing. This was not a glorious white wedding. This was not the pure spotless bride presented to God's faithful prophet. This was a woman who was diseased, who was morally bankrupt who in a time where there was very little medicine probably had every venereal disease known to man, every STD known to man, spiritually oppressed, demonised, a complete outcast. And Hosea, at the command of God, because he was requested to by God, he came and he approached this woman and said, I want you to be my wife. And he took her as his bride. Now there's prophetic significance to all this, but I want you to see something. Then after that marriage had been consummated and some time went on, 
That woman who had been brought back from this life of prostitution decided that she was going to go back to all her old lovers. And so Hosea is asked by God to pursue her down and buy her back. And she had sunk so low that he bought her for the measly price of $75. He bought her life for $75. She was living in adultery, a sin punishable by death to all those in that nation at that time. And God said, I don't want to kill her. I want to save her. That's the gospel. Hosea is Jesus. The prostitute is us. Every single one of us. It's as pure and as real as the gospel, gospel gets that 800 years before Christ was even born, God sent a prophet on a mission to demonstrate to all of us, thousands of years down the track, how pure, how perfect, how all-encompassing, how forgiving his love actually is. That we, that have prostituted ourselves to the world, have prostituted ourselves before demons, have allowed all sorts of vile things into our life, God says, I don't care what you've done, I have to have you. And I will bankrupt heaven itself. I will come down in the form of my son and lay myself on a cross so that you can have everything that I promised you in my word. <laughs> and I saw this. I'm reading it. Very early this morning, I'm reading it. I'm going, uh, I just, uh, I couldn't get over it. The, 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 the picture that it gives of what God's heart is for us. He doesn't want to throw down thunderbolts on you. He wants you. He wants you. He wants to make you his pure, spotless bride. And it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. You will stand in those white robes of righteousness. You already do. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus as soon as that salvation process started. But he wants you to be more. He wants you to be more than someone that's just come to the altar. He wants you to be his ambassador. He wants you to be the instrument through which he releases his Holy Spirit to everybody around you so that they come to salvation, so that they come into the fullness of what God has for them. And here's the kicker. Here's the thing, because I'm saying to myself, God, am I misrepresenting you in some way when I use Hosea as an example of Jesus? Am I making too much of this? Am I simplifying all the theology that I've learned? Let me tell you something. Do you know what Hosea, the name Hosea, means in Hebrew? It means salvation. Do you know what the name Goma, the prostitute bride who he married, do you know what her name means? Complete. God tells you today, that his salvation process in your life is not complete until you come as his bride. That he has to have you and he has paid every price. And if we would only respond with the fullness of our hearts and lay down the things that encircle us, that ensnare us, that try and pull us away from him. If we would say, no, I have to have him. Because when we respond to him like that, he responds in greater measure toward us. Don't get me started. <laughs> Yesterday I turned 57. Now, somebody told me when I was 20 that I would even turn 57. I'd go, you're kidding, mate. I'll be dead by the time I'm 30. And I probably should have been. But the significance of this is not the 57 years of age that I have somehow attained to. The significance of this is that I've now been... 21 years in the kingdom of God. I gave my life back to God at the age of 36, and now I'm 57. That's 21 years in the kingdom. And I felt God um, asking me, John, 
If you could go back 21 years to the start of your relationship with God, some of the people listening to me in this church today, you're not even 21 years old or you're just 21 years old. If you could go back, this is what God asked me, if you could go back 21 years to the beginning of when you came to the throne of grace and said, Jesus, I've done it my way. I've completely messed up my entire life. I give my life to you. What would you do differently over those 21 years? And my answer is really simple. If I could go back 21 years ago and come before God, I would say that without... How do I put this? Without any measure of compromise. Without any measure of holding some of myself back from you. Without any measure of self-preservation. Without any measure of thinking that I know what to do with my life better than you do. Without any compromise in my character. Without holding any aspect of my life back from you. I come before you now and I surrender the whole lot forever. That's what I would do. Because God's plan for my life has been proven out in those 21 years that he has restored and restored and restored and restored. Even when the enemy would try and have me believe that it was being destroyed, it was being restored. Even in those seasons when I thought, God, what are you doing? There's nothing happening. God was building something. And he was helping me to let the things go that held me back from his best. Because God doesn't want you to have better. He wants you to have best. To me. (laughs) People could, could enter into... All sorts of theological arguments with me about the nature of salvation, all the rest. I don't care. I really don't care. I'm past caring about theological arguments. To me, salvation is the relentless pursuit of God until we see the fullness of his glory manifested in and through us. Salvation is the relentless pursuit by God of us. Until we see the fullness of his glory manifested in and through us. As we finish this morning. God's asking me to do this. Can we all stand this morning? Just bear with me while I find this. now in that moment I felt the Lord asked me as his prophetic voice this morning to you asked me to ask you this question it's from 1st Kings 18 Verse 21, and it's the confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on the top of Mount Carmel. And before the fire fell, before uh, God proved himself with his outpouring of his Holy Spirit, he instructed Elijah to ask the people this question. This is something that God's been asking me. 
How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Baal stands for every distraction from God's purpose in your life. And God is asking us today, do we want to falter between two kingdoms? There's a father of lies that is after your heart and there is a father of lights that is after your heart and wants to give you the fullness. My also call this morning is this. If you have things that you need to lay down because you want to passionately pursue the Lord with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your might, I invite you to come down the front and do business with God. If there are things in your life that have held you back from His best, if there are areas of doubt and unbelief in you, where you have tried to hold on to different aspects of your life or your lifestyle or the way that you do things, then I ask you, out of the kingdom of heaven, from the throne of grace, God is saying, will you lay down those things that have held you back and come into the fullness of everything that I have for you? Because I do not give in half measure, says the Lord. There is no limit to the outpouring, says the Lord this morning. There is no, no limit to the outpouring that I will pour in and through a life that is completely submitted to my will. When you come before me this morning, says the Lord, be prepared. Because in the things that you used to think, oh, well, this is okay, that's okay, I can do this, I can do that, God doesn't really care. I want to tell you that God is saying this morning that his still small voice is going to come in the convicting power and he's going to convict you about the things that you have paid attention to that you, should, that you ought not. God wants the people... <sighs> In a move of God, which has already started around the world. There is a move of God in his people. And a move of God is marked by purity and holiness. But most of all, by surrender. Surrender.